On this Monday night, Toronto's top cop quits. The surprise announcement from Mark Saunders. I'll be a free agent. While across Canada and the U.S., calls to defund police forces gain traction. What it could mean. Anger from migrant agricultural workers Canada relies on. He said we should get home if we, if we don't like it. The appalling conditions and the hazards they say they face from COVID-19. Positive news during the pandemic. Why New Zealand has reason to celebrate. And the mystery of an ancient treasure chest unlocked. The unfindable has been found. The single secret left in a million dollar mystery. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with big developments related to the police in the U.S. and here in Canada. The calls for change in how the police operate and for black lives to matter have never been louder. Now calls to defund police are gaining traction too. That doesn't mean dismantling police forces completely, but reallocating a chunk of their funding to housing, health care and education, things that will make life in marginalized communities better. And in Toronto, the police chief, Mark Saunders, surprised everyone when he announced he's leaving. Saunders, a 35-year veteran of the force, became the first black police chief of the Toronto Police Service in 2015. On Friday, he took a knee in the protest, tweeting, We see you and we are listening. We have to all stay in this together to make change. He says he's leaving with a heavy heart, but wants to put his family first. In our top story tonight, Eric Sorensen looks at Saunders' departure and the broader debate about the future of policing. And it's time to say thank you, Toronto. It was a shock. Thank you for Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders announcing he'll step down us. the end of next month. It comes at a time of massive protests accusing police departments across North America of racism and brutality towards black people. Saunders, who took a knee in solidarity with marchers last week, says family was his main consideration in leaving. But he cautions against mounting calls to defund police departments. If we get it right, then there needs to be other agencies that satisfy the needs of the community. In the absence of that, things will not work. It's as simple as that. Activists say they are underserved and over-policed. We're the last generation that's going to stand for this. We're not going to stand for this. It's spurring debates to reimagine public safety, so police are not the primary response to incidents such as homelessness or mental health. Policing is probably not the most effective way to deal with those particular challenges, that those are individuals that are better in the hands of other service providers that the city and the province can can offer. It means that we want uh, a healthy, safe response to incidents so that black people don't end up dead because they ask for help. The Prime Minister said Ottawa is always reviewing how public dollars are spent on policing and promises specific action on police body cameras. And I will certainly be talking about the province, with the provinces and premiers uh, about the need to move forward on uh, measures like body cameras. The urgency to act follows the death of George Floyd while being arrested by Minneapolis police two weeks ago. The city council there has pledged to dismantle its police department. To end policing as we know it and to recreate systems of public safety that actually keep us safe. But for the U.S. president, widely criticized for his response to protesters, defunding police gives him a new argument for law and order. You eliminate police officers, um, you will have chaos, crime and anarchy in the streets. And that's something that's unacceptable to the president. Back in Canada, the departing Toronto police chief says his work will not be finished when he leaves his job. I see a lot of young black boys getting killed by young black boys. Uh, law enforcement deals with those symptoms and uh, I want to help the cure for the disease. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. When Mark Saunders took the job, he was just the second black police chief in Canada's history. He served through two horrific attacks in that city in April 2018 when 10 people were killed, when a van plowed down pedestrians on Young Street, and three months later a mass shooting on Toronto's popular Danforth Avenue left two people dead and more than a dozen injured. Saunders faced controversy over his department's handling of several missing men connected to Toronto's gay village and concerns they were victims of a serial murderer. Police later linked the disappearances of eight men to Bruce MacArthur, who was convicted of their murders in 2019. 
The news of Saunders' departure comes at a time of turmoil. Across the continent, there's outrage over systemic racism in policing after the death of George Floyd. Today, the now former Minneapolis officer charged with his death made his first court appearance. Derek Chauvin, who was caught on video pinning Floyd down with a knee on his neck, faces up to 40 years in prison if convicted. He's been charged with second-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. The judge in the case has set Chauvin's bail at $1.25 million. Three other former officers accused of aiding and abetting Floyd's death had bail set at $750,000. As Chauvin appeared in court, hundreds of mourners lined up in Floyd's hometown of Houston, Texas today to pay their respects. This will be the third and final memorial before George Floyd is buried tomorrow. The governor of Texas, a Republican, was among the first at the public viewing of Floyd's gold casket. George Floyd is going to change the arc of the future of the United States. George Floyd has not died in vain. His life will be a living legacy. There are signs the death of George Floyd may truly be a turning point in the U.S. As Jackson Prosco reports, more and more political leaders are making commitments to change. In this moment of change, barriers have become monuments. Outside the White House, a three-meter-high security fence added amidst the protests is today covered in calls to address racial injustice. While inside the U.S. Capitol, Democrats paused for 8 minutes and 46 seconds of silence before announcing a bill to reform policing in America. Never again should the world be subjected to witnessing what we saw on the streets in Minneapolis, the slow murder of an individual by a uniformed police officer. Wake up! Wake up! It all marks a long-awaited turning point for many Americans. <laughs> Minneapolis has voted to disband its local police department, New York, home to the largest police force in the country, is vowing changes too. It takes, in New York City, too long for there to be accountability for officers who do the wrong thing. For the first time in a generation, public opinion is overwhelmingly on the side of those calling for reform. By a margin of two to one, Americans are more troubled by the actions of police in the death of George Floyd than they are by the resulting protests that turned violent. 57% of Americans believe police are more likely to use excessive force against black Americans, up from just 33% from six years ago after Eric Garner died at the hands of New York City police. It feels like I get to be a part of history and a part of the group of people who are trying to change the world for everyone. The police brutality experienced by those protesting that very issue may have helped turn the tide. Scenes of tear gas and pepper spray deployed against peaceful demonstrators have fueled the calls for lasting change. So too have images like these, the latest accusation of excessive force. A police officer in Virginia is now charged with assault after tasing and striking a man who reportedly told first responders he needed to detox. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Alberta's police watchdog says two RCMP officers have been charged with criminal negligence related to a 2018 shooting and the death of a 31-year-old man. And in another case shown on this video, three RCMP officers in Prince George, B.C. are charged with assault related to an arrest in February of 2016. One officer faces charges of assault with a weapon and obstruction, while two other officers have been charged with assault causing bodily harm. Now to the other big story we continue to follow the pandemic. Several provinces are lifting more public health restrictions. In Newfoundland and Labrador, outdoor pools, camping, day camps, retail stores and restaurants are back in business with restrictions. Some team sports can also resume as well as services at private health clinics and salons. Saskatchewan is lifting its non-essential travel ban in the north, while restaurants across the province can reopen at 50% capacity. Daycares and places of worship are also reopening with restrictions. And in Quebec today, movie and TV production can resume, as well as team sports, all with some physical distancing and hygiene restrictions in place. And starting on Friday, parts of Ontario will move to stage two of reopening there, but not in the greater Toronto and Hamilton regions. They still have the highest concentration of Ontario's COVID-19 cases. We will continue talking to local officials who are playing a critical role in determining what areas can open. And I am confident that the rest of the province will get the stage two very, very soon. 
Stage two allows for outdoor dining, camping and gatherings up to 10 people will also be allowed. Some salon and retail services are also opening with restrictions. The Canada-U.S. border has been closed to non-essential travel for over two and a half months. Now the Canadian government is allowing family members who were separated in that process to reunite. An exemption will begin at midnight to foreign nationals who are immediate family members of Canadian citizens and permanent residents. Family members will be defined as spouses or common-law partners, dependent children, and parents or legal guardians. Anyone wanting to enter the country from the U.S. cannot have COVID-19 or be showing any symptoms. They'll also be required to quarantine for 14 days once they arrive in Canada. Canada also had travel exemptions in place for temporary foreign workers who are vital to many industries here, particularly in the agriculture sector. Canada usually brings in as many as 60,000 seasonal agricultural workers every year through the Temporary Foreign Workers Program. They live and work in close quarters, and COVID-19 outbreaks have led to two deaths of migrant workers in Canada. As Mike Lecouture reports, there are troubling signs many are not being properly taken care of. This is like modern day, modern day slavery. A temporary foreign worker gives a shocking account of conditions where he works. We've agreed to hide his identity because he's worried speaking out will get him fired. But he's speaking to Global News because going to the farmer got him nowhere. He said we should get the f home if we if we if we don't like it. And he's been doing this for many, many years. The Migrant Workers Alliance for Change says they've had thousands of other complaints just like that. The group's new report chronicles issues on farms that they say have gone unchecked for years. Two temporary foreign workers recently died of COVID-19. Two more are in intensive care and advocates say issues have been exacerbated by the pandemic. There's rats living in their oven, cramped um, bedrooms, just really conditions that are really unsafe and not, not healthy for anyone. Now, all temporary foreign workers were supposed to be quarantined when they arrived in Canada, but some say they were still sleeping in bunk beds. In BC, workers were sent to self-isolate in hotels paid for by the province. New Brunswick had banned temporary foreign workers, but reversed that decision because agriculture and seafood producers were unable to find enough local laborers. Advocates had asked the federal government to make temporary foreign workers permanent residents so they'd have the same rights as Canadian workers. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau wouldn't respond to that directly. Whether they're permanent residents or whether they're simply temporary foreign workers, we need to do a better job of protecting uh, temporary agricultural workers in this country. A promise to do more, but not the improvements to health and safety being demanded by workers who are a key part of Canada's agricultural sector. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. There are new details on the deadly crash of a Canadian Armed Forces helicopter off the coast of Greece. The Cyclone helicopter was deployed with the Navy frigate HMCS Fredericton as part of a NATO mission when it crashed into the Ionian Sea on April 29th. In an initial report released today, the Department of National Defence says the aircraft did not respond as the crew would have anticipated during what it calls a complex manoeuvre as it approached the ship. The report says the crew could not recover at the low altitude and the aircraft then entered a high energy descent and impacted the water. The investigation will continue to look at the aircraft's systems and any human factors. All six service members on board died. Global News has learned the RCMP will include incels in its terrorism awareness guide just weeks after the first ever terror charge was laid in connection to the online movement. The incel is described as one of the most dangerous subcultures. As Abigail Beeman reports, RCMP aimed to prevent further attacks in Canada linked to the extremist ideology. Police laid the first ever terrorism charges linked to the incel movement a couple of weeks ago after a murder in Toronto. Involuntary celibates gained wider attention after the 2018 van attack in the same city. Now, Global News has learned incels will be added to the RCMP's terrorism guide, currently undergoing an update. It's a really critical piece of public communications from the RCMP. Taking, you know, really two years at least to include incel and the incel ideology in this guide is surprising.
it's part of a, a broader recognition, I believe, of uh, the the kinds of threats that are posed uh, around terrorism, uh, aside from Islamist inspired. Hate and extremism expert Barbara Perry says while the number of incels who are violent may be small, the narratives are dangerous. Now, what's an appropriate response then uh, if you uh, can't get a date, right? If women aren't attracted to you, well, violence is an appropriate response. And, you know, we know how high the rate of violence against women is anyway. And you add this permission, uh, if you will. Uh, and I think it's a it's a risk that we need to take seriously. We recognize that it's both a public safety, but also a public health um, crisis. Moonshot CVE is studying incels and their presence in this country. It's been given nearly half a million dollars from Public Safety Canada to do it and already produced this primer of their own. It's tempting not to take it seriously on one level. Um, the, the feelings that a lot of these individuals have um, it, are easy to ridicule, frankly, and a lot of people have, um, but that only makes the problem worse. In addition to the upcoming move by the RCMP, CSIS noted incels in a recent public report, another example of agencies recognizing broader terrorism threats. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Anti-racism protesters take matters into their own hands. Coming up, the statue of a slave owner that came tumbling down in England. The calls for an end to racial inequality are reverberating well beyond the U.S. Huge rallies in the U.K. this weekend were peaceful, apart from some violent flashes. In the city of Bristol, a statue of a slave trader was toppled. And as Crystal Gamansing reports, it's calling into question who we choose to celebrate. A firestorm of reaction after protesters of all colors topple the statue of Edward Colston. I think that it has been um, idolized for far too long in this city. Well, I think that is utterly disgraceful, and that speaks to the acts of disorder, public disorder. Colston was a 17th century merchant who made a fortune buying, transporting, and selling people. On Sunday, people took turns rolling his bronze statue down the street, then hurled it into the harbor. Police were there, but didn't step in. We made a very tactical decision that to stop people from doing that act may have caused further disorder and we decided the safest piece to do in terms of our policing tactics was to allow it to take place. An official investigation has been launched but the mayor doesn't appear to be troubled by what happened. It being thrown in the harbour and that almost piece of historical poetry where you know a man who undoubtedly had uh, slaves thrown off his ships uh, during the, the passage at some point ended up underwater. There are several petitions calling for a statue of a prominent black figure to be erected where Colston's stood for 125 years. It seems such a formidable presence and yet the lifting of it and moving it just seemed quite effortless. The Colston statue will be retrieved from the water and likely put into a museum. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Still ahead, no cases, no worries. The coronavirus is eradicated in New Zealand. Once the epicenter of America's COVID-19 outbreak, New York City entered phase one of its reopening plan today. 100 days after the first case, the infection rate is declining. About 400,000 people headed back to work in non-essential businesses like retail and construction sites, but with limited operations. Some retailers are waiting for tensions over the death of George Floyd to ease, and many stores in the city remain closed. New Zealand is another matter. The Prime Minister there lifted all COVID-19 restrictions today and the country has been declared virus-free. I, I did a little dance. <laughs> Jacinda Ardern is being praised for locking down New Zealand early on March 25th and giving the public a clear path out of the pandemic. There's no more physical distancing. All schools and workplaces are open. The border is closed to foreigners, though. Ardern has warned New Zealand will certainly see new cases again when that changes. Brazil's government has removed months of critical data from its COVID-19 tracking website. The move is adding to calls the president is trying to cover up the true scale of the crisis. The country originally logged all cases of COVID-19 and deaths and gave specific data for the country's 27 states and municipalities. Now it's only showing the number of COVID-19 cases recorded 
in the last 24 hours. Next, discovering the unexpected rewards from one man's modern day treasure hunt. Over 10 years ago, a wealthy art dealer buried $2 million worth of treasure somewhere in the Rocky Mountains of New Mexico and put out tantalizing clues in a poem. Begin it where warm waters halt and take it in the canyon down, not far, but too far to walk. Well, now someone has finally cracked those clues and found the treasure. Robin Gill reports. Deep in the Rocky Mountains in Santa Fe, New Mexico, there really was a treasure at the end of the rainbow. A 13th century bronze chest filled with gold and gems, worth an estimated $2 million. Forrest Fenn, an antiques collector, hid the treasure more than a decade ago. Well, I made it hard deliberately. If it was easy, anyone could do it. The clues were in a poem he wrote. From there it's no place for the meek, the end is ever drawing nigh. Someone picked up on the lines of verse and found the location. The modern-day Indiana Jones, who wants to remain anonymous, sent Fenn a picture of his newfound wealth. Let's go find the treasure. Fenn wanted to tempt people into the wilderness, which he says is the real reward. Hundreds tried, including the Harp family. It didn't lead to riches, but that didn't matter. It's brought us together out in nature, out in sunshine. I mean, I think that was what Forrest wanted, and it gave us a perspective of, of the world that our children will never forget. Still, five people lost their lives on this expedition. Fenn, sorry they died, but insisted it wasn't dangerous. The treasure is not hidden in a, in, a, in a mine. A lot of these old mines are dangerous. What was his secret is now someone else's. And that lucky anonymous individual is the new mystery. Robin Gill, Global News. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this beautiful garden in Spencer Smith Park in Burlington, Ontario. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.